morning, friends. Hello. Welcome to worship today. Uh, today, we're going to be exploring what it means when we say, Your kingdom come. Uh, and so please sing along if you know this one. Well, hello and good morning to you. Welcome to New Promise. We're so glad that you are here and worshiping with us today. Uh, if you are a visitor, I um, want to let you know about a couple of things. First of all, we have a little um, card in the seat back pocket in front of you um, that you can fill in. And then after the service, return it to the welcome window and we have a little gift for you. Um, because yay, we're so happy you're here. Um, we also have a card you'll see there uh, where you can add prayer requests. Um, 
And uh, at the time when the offering basket comes around, you can put um, the little card there with uh, your prayer request. Um, you can also indicate whether you'd like um, a pastor to reach out or not, or make it public or not. Um, and speaking of prayer, uh, after the service, we'll have uh, Sal Mendez, who is one of our Stephen ministers, um, available uh, up here by the choir ch chairs for prayer. So I invite you to do that. Uh, if you are a guest, we have um, an open communion table, which means that all who believe in Jesus are uh, welcome to commune with us. And so the way that that works is uh, the usher will indicate when it's time for you to come forward. You come forward via the center aisle. You can choose between uh, wine, which you'll take an empty cup for, or grape juice. The acolyte will be standing here with pre-filled cups that have grape juice in them. All the bread is gluten-free, so you'll come up, get the bread, get the wine slash grape juice, and then return via the side aisles. So um, we have a few announcements. So first is that this, this, sat this is this Saturday, right? Yes, this Saturday, there is a free community breakfast. Uh, we're having French toast because the Olympics are in France. <laughs> so right, obviously. Uh, egg, sausage, coffee, juice. We're going to be watching the Olympics. We'll be playing on TV. So come. This is for the neighborhood. This is for your friends. Um, just bring whomever uh, and enjoy some time together. So that will be very fun. Um, I have heard the dispatch from the youth trip that they have returned safely, though not, uh, not without incident. They missed... <laughs> their shuttle because of the, all the delays. And so the amazing Vic Sparling had to drive down and pick them up from the airport in Vegas. They got home, Joe says, around 3 a.m. So, you know, wow, good job team. For that reason, you might appreciate uh, Pastor Jill, uh, who was with them, is not here today because I hope she's still sleeping. I hope you're not watching this, Jill. So. Uh, there are still some spots uh, for day camp if you or a young person that you love um, has not signed up yet. There is still a chance to do so. Um, and we um, are in need of um, a chef beyond compare to help us with day camp, our previous cook. Uh, was, is uh, one of our previous cooks is not going to be able to make it. So if you like cooking, assembling sandwiches. Actually, I think this is a leading a class with kids doing a cooking component. I have no idea what component. I'm talking about. So, Say that again, Joe. Uh, so we, we are <laughs> looking for somebody who can do one of the components with kids on a cooking thing. I don't know what they're making. I just know it's going to be amazing. Uh, is it just for one day of day camp? That I don't know. Okay. See, this is why we need Jill, because yep. we are pretty much clueless. We don't so know anything. Jill, things. now I really hope you're not watching this. Um, <laughs> contact Jill. She will know. Pastor Jill will know much better than we do, because we are useless. Um, okay, final announcement is that, uh, believe it or not, the kids are going back to school pretty soon, which is so wild to me. But we are doing a back to school blessing during the 930 worship on August 11th. So um, be sure to come if you are a teacher, student, staff member at a, an institution of learning um, and we will bless you. So uh, with that, I invite you to stand as you're able and uh, face the baptismal font for a brief order of confession and forgiveness. We confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pause to remember those things for which we need forgiveness. Merciful God, like willful children, we have turned away from you. We have refused to heed your call to love you and our neighbors as ourselves. 
We have wandered wandered after after other other gods gods, and squandered your extravagant gifts to us. We have been ungrateful for all that you have provided and refused to share these things with others. Draw us back into your embrace. Cleanse us by your unconditional love and mercy that we might live in a state of complete trust in you and act out of that trust on behalf of others. Beloved children of God, your heavenly Father throws open his arms like the father of the prodigal son and welcomes you back always. For the sake of Jesus, our brother, God forgives you all your sins. Amen. Teach us to pray, Jesus, our brother. Help us to see the kingdom of God. God calls us to be co-creators of the kingdom. May we work for the kingdom here and now. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ.
Sovereign God, your holy reign of peace and justice is not confined to some far off future, but it is present in the here and now. Jesus taught us to ask for your kingdom to come every time we pray, not that we might hasten the end of all things, but that we might, with your help, bring it into being among us. Guide us toward actions that will facilitate the breaking in of your reign today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Please read responsively from Psalm 93. The Lord is king, robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Ever since the world began, your throne has been established. You are from everlasting. The waters have lifted up. O oh Lord, the waters have lifted up their voice. The waters have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the sound of many waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. Mightier is the Lord who dwells on high. Your testimonies are very sure. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. The Gospel of the Lord. A reading from Ephesians chapter 2. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that he, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access to one spirit and the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structures, structures join together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Okay, at this time in the service, we invite any kids in the congregation to come on up for a little time up front. Anybody who'd like to come? Welcome, welcome, hello. How is everybody? I got a couple of these, one for everybody. There you go, there you go. Oops, there you go. So uh, today we're focusing on the petition, thy kingdom come. What comes to mind for you when you hear the word kingdom? Like a castle. Like a castle, good. What else? Like a village. Like a what? A village. A village, right. A, a, right, a kingdom includes villages where kings rule, right? Yeah. 
You know, I have a kingdom. <laughs> My kingdom is a small house just up the street here. Although, to be fair, I'm just a puppet king, so. <clears throat> but, uh, here's, what our, um, here's what our bulletin says about the kingdom of God. So listen to this. The kingdom of God is when and where God is in charge of the world. When we share God's love, God's kingdom comes, right? So God's kingdom is this thing that uh, is coming in the future when God rules over all, but God's kingdom is also right here and now when we share God's love. So let's think together for a little bit. How are some, what are some things we could do to make God's kingdom present now? What do you think? Pray, I love it. Be nice, I love it. Share the word of Christ. Share the word of Christ. Great job, I love that. Love your neighbors. Yeah, I love it. If you if you see a homeless person, maybe give them a few Yeah, share with those who are in need. I love that. You guys are so smart. These are all the ways that you can make God's kingdom a reality here today for the people around you, right? All right, let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks that you are our king and that your kingdom comes um, in us and through us as we wait for your kingdom to come in all things and over all things. Amen. Thank you. So, today our focus on the Lord's Prayer is on these three simple words. Your kingdom come. You wouldn't think you could get a whole sermon out of three words, but believe it or not, I think you can. <clears throat> Your kingdom come. And I guess it requires us to ask the question, what is the kingdom that is coming? You see, all too often I think we project our expectations of worldly kingdoms onto God's kingdom as if all kingdoms act the same and the only difference is whose name it's in. As if the same tricks and tactics you see in the powers and principalities of the world are okay or good even, if they're deployed in the name of God. Well friends, that's how you get things like terrorist attacks. Assassination attempts riots, insurrections, so-called holy wars. People who are convinced they have God on their side willing to take up arms in pursuit of power, praying your kingdom come as they load their rifles, arm their bombs, and strap on their suicide vests. Those who use the language of righteousness, virtue, justice, or love to justify violence against their neighbors are not living into the kingdom of God, but are blaspheming his name to serve their own purposes. It can be seductive the sweet, hot pleasure of hostility, of hatred. But do not be deceived. When we pray, your kingdom come, we don't repackage the kingdoms of the world in God language. 
When we pray your kingdom come, we are praying for the advent of an entirely different kind of kingdom and we are pledging ourselves to the, uh, to the loyal service of an entirely different kind of king. And so again, we're forced to confront the question, what is the kingdom that is coming? It's why I chose the um, Ephesians passage to accompany our text today. And this is why I asked you to bring your Bibles. So if you brought them, pull it on out. Uh, you can also look it up on your phone. Uh, I won't think you're texting, um, <laughs> although I won't know. So I guess you could trick me. <laughs> if my kid were here, she'd be like, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to go to Ephesians 2, Ephesians chapter 2. It's in the New Testament, past, you know, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts, and the Rome, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Ephesians, right? Galatians. Drat. Thank you, guys. So Ephesians 2. And while you're looking it up, I want to share just a little bit about um, why I picked this passage. It's, it's actually a passage I have returned to again and again over the past several years. Um, and in fact, uh, I was looking back at um, my sermon archive, uh, and I realized that the, the first time I preached on this text, and the first time this text really became a cornerstone of kind of how I try to think about things that are going on in the world today, um, was like exactly four years ago. It was this same Sunday in July uh, in the summer of 2020, if you remember the summer of 2020. Uh, then we hadn't just experienced the assassination attempt on a major political candidate like we have recently, but my, t my Twin Cities neighborhood um, was still recovering from uh, George Floyd's death and the rioting that occurred in the wake of it and the discontent and the anger with a bitter presidential election looming over the horizon. Sound familiar? <laughs> And so for the past four years, this, pa this passage in Ephesians has served as something of a north star for me. Uh, a check on my own worst impulses. Um, a source of conviction and, I confess to you, an impetus for repentance. And ultimately, I think, a picture for the kingdom, of the kingdom for which we pray. And so I wonder if we could walk through it together. Um, so we start with verse 11, right? Therefore, remember that formerly, formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope, and without God in the world. Now, a little bit of context here, right? It's, I think it's easy as Christians for us to forget that the covenants of the promise were initially given to Israel, right? And, and a major reason that we've chosen to use the narrative lectionary over the past handful of years here is to remind us how the Christian story is, is, is really a part of the story of Israel. God chose Israel to be his people. And through Israel, God promised to bless and reconcile the entire world. And this is important because Gentiles, like the, the letter of Ephesians is addressing, were not immediately included, right? Israel was a nation, uh, a, a distinct people group with a particular identity bound together by God's promises and commandments. Now, even though by the time of Jesus, the Jews had been conquered by the Roman Empire and a bunch of other empires before. They just kept getting conquered. It was a, kind of a bummer. Um, 
and lived within what was politically Roman territory, they still understood themselves as a distinct nation within the greater empire. And I think this, this reality carries some profound implications for our current moment. Like, you, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can if you want to, but, but how many of you feel like you're living in a totally different country than, say, the other half of the country? <laughs> right? Like, not unlike the Jewish people in the Roman world, you can live in the same city, or even on the same street, or even sit in the same pew, right, as a neighbor, and have what feels like a totally different identity, as if there are two nations within one, nations with different priorities, news and information sources, values and worldviews, and within these differences, there is accelerating negativity, even hostility toward one another. Like, over the past 20 years, the number of members of one party who view the other party as very unfavorable has tripled. Republicans and Democrats say, by overwhelming margins, that members of the other party are more close-minded unintelligent, immoral, lazy, and unpatriotic. In 2019, a PRRI survey showed that both Republicans and Democrats would be more upset if their child married a person of the opposing political party than if they married a person of a different religious faith. More and more, we don't even interact with those with opposing perspectives. Where we once found common cause in volunteering neighborhood service, and yes, church, <laughs> an increasingly secular culture is leaving those touch points behind. Now many people say they don't even have friends of the opposing political party. Others report having once close relationships disrupted, strained, and broken, and this, my friends, is where I start to feel extremely convicted. Now, I am someone who tries really, really hard to see other points of view, but I have also felt myself being pulled by the forces of polarization. I have felt the white-hot anger of a social media post I disagreed with. I have swallowed back, and sometimes I confess to you have not swallowed back, a flippant remark. I have allowed myself to be caught up in these forces like a surging river after a storm carried downstream in a white water of hostility. And then this verse, going back to your text. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. You see, understood biblically, peace is not merely the absence of war or a feeling of serenity. It is a state of wholeness and completeness that is lived out socially. It implies reconciliation, harmony, and justice. It is a hallmark of salvation. And this passage reminds us where we find peace, in Christ. 
In fact, he, Jesus, his very self, not the idea of Jesus, or a list of right and wrong, or a political party, or a platform, or a candidate, or a country, but Jesus' own body and blood given for us as a gift of love is himself the peace we seek. And this is where the rubber really meets the road. It says, in for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So the barrier is our hostility toward one another. But in Christ, this is destroyed. And why? What is the purpose of this? His purpose, the text goes on to say, was to create in himself one humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. By which he put to death their hostility. Jesus leaves nothing as he found it. Not our hearts, not our communities, not our politics. Can you hear the radical call in these verses? the different kind of kingdom over which Jesus himself is king. It says, take these divisions, right? These entirely different cultures, these, these two nations, Jew and Gentile, red and blue, and see that in the cross we are made one, forging a lasting peace between us by which the hostility we carry toward one another is put to death put to death. And when we allow rifts to form between one another, those rifts are filled with hostility, not, not just disagreement, right? That's fine, that's normal, that's gonna happen. We're not talking about disagreement, but not just believing that, that a sister or brother holds a wrong opinion, but believing them to be wrong in and of themselves in who they are. That's the thing that Christ has put to death. That's the thing we cannot allow to fester in our own hearts because Christ's blood has drawn both of us near. For Jesus Christ put to death that hostility on the cross. He killed it alongside the other forces of sin that once ruled us and drew us to him and in so doing, draws us to each other. The text goes on to say, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. My friends, we are not two nations. We are fellow citizens. And not just citizens, but members of the same household, a family, built up together with a foundation of scripture and Jesus himself, the cornerstone, and in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord, and in him too, we are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. 
See, in ancient times, the temple was the the dwelling place of God himself, a, a physical building where God's presence was thought to reside, a structure that helped define the, new, uh, define the Jews as a nation and a people. But now we are the temple. We are the dwelling place of God. No longer does he come to a single location, but now his presence is in our bodies. Not just as individual Christians, but together. All of us, the entire body of Christ. And the kingdom is a place that lives within us and among us where our divisions are destroyed, our hostility is vanquished, and a lasting peace is forged by the presence of the true and living God. This is what it looks like when we pray, your kingdom come. It looks like our hostility being put to death on the cross of Christ. It looks like strangers becoming friends and enemies becoming members of the household of God. It looks like the peace of Jesus Christ forging a new humanity from our sinful, broken past. May we mean it when we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. you to profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Together with our sisters and brothers in Christ throughout the world, we pray for the needs of all that God has made. God of all, you are among us at all times and in all places, fully present in the world, even when it appears otherwise. Help us to recognize you and in our neighbors and to work to reveal your love and justice to all the world. God our Father, you have redeemed not just humanity, but all of creation by Jesus' death and resurrection. Help us to care for the natural world as a neighbor and see our interdependence as a blessing to be preserved. God, our Father, hear our prayer. you are the highest and best of all leaders, sovereign God. Help human leaders at every level to recognize your divine will and work to bring about your kingdom of peace on earth. God, our Father, you are our hope and our healer. Hold all who experience health challenges of any kind in your loving arms. Renew and restore them and all of us each day. We also pray for those listed in Promising News who have asked for prayer. Prayers from the congregation are now invited, either aloud or from your hearts. God, our Father, you have set the stars and planets in motion and the seasons change by your design. Lord, protect us from bad weather. Protect us from all weather. Be with us during each season, each day. God, our Father, Lord, help us bring about your kingdom right here, right now, on earth. Through our actions, help us to show your love to strangers and neighbors. God, our Father, hear our prayer. you are the ruler of the living and of the dead. Help us to remember those who have gone before with gratitude that they might give us the hope of eternal life in you. God, our Father, hear our prayer. confident that you care for all our needs, we lift these prayers, spoken and unspoken, into your loving hands. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Please share that sign of peace. Yeah. 
to stand as we bring forward our gifts and offerings. you lavish upon us all good things. Except now these our gifts and our tithes, out of what you have first given us. Use them for the work of bringing the kingdom of God into the world here and now. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. 
do this for the remembrance of me. At the beginning of this series on the Lord's Prayer, we talked about uh, how the Lord's Prayer is one element of worship that is common throughout the world where Christians gather to worship. And so, in celebration of that, uh, we are going to pray the Lord's Prayer silently as we hear it spoken in German by our own Uli Schultz. Let's pray. Vater unser, der du bist im Himmel, geheiligt werde dein Name, dein Reich komme, dein Wille geschehe, wie im Himmel also auch auf Erden. Unser tägliches Brot gib uns heute und vergib uns unsere Sünden, wie wir auch vergeben unseren Sündigen. Und führe uns nicht in Versuchung, sondern löse uns von dem Bügel, denn dein ist das Reich und die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit in Ewigkeit. Amen. Amen. Jesus, our one and only true King, invites you as friends to this table of grace and mercy and feeds you on his own body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Come with your sisters and brothers in Christ and be nourished for the work of the kingdom. I invite the congregation to be seated.
God, as the disciples ate and drank with their risen Lord, we have been nourished with the very presence of Christ. Through this meal, may we be strengthened to keep your word and proclaim the power of your love in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now receive this blessing. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Come near. Thanks be to God.